In part two of Deep State Modus Operandi, I hope to expand your knowledge on why and how this is becoming the biggest scandal in American political history. Here now to discuss the efforts of the Deep State deep state conspiracy and campaign against President Trump and his administration, as well as the Trump-Russia conspir conspiracy theorists. Peter Schweitzer, president of the Government Accountability Institute. He's also executive producer of Clinton Cash, which is based on his best-selling uh, book of the same name. Great to have you with us, Peter. This is a remarkable Excellent. time. The deep state, the deep state conspiracy, the, uh, the campaign that's at work, we have never seen in this country anything like what we behold today, uh, as it is clear, a highly organized and powerful group of people are trying to subvert the presidency uh, of uh, Mr. Trump. Well, let me tell you, um, I, I would recommend everybody go out get a academic book that was published last year called What Washington Gets Wrong. And it's two scholars from Johns Hopkins University who do a massive survey of senior unelected executives in government, basically the deep state, and asks them a bunch of questions. And as the authors describe, the deep state has contemptuous attitudes towards the average American. They think they are far less educated than they actually are. They think they're far more dependent on government than they are. Right. They're arrogant. They believe and they say in these surveys that if the American people want one thing and they think it's wrong, they're going to push something else. There's a massive disconnect and the deep state is real and it's a threat to our republic form of government. And we're watching it at work. It is the group of people, at least part of the group of people uh, uh, that uh, uh, President Trump campaigned against uh, for a year and a half. These are the elitists who hold power, who look down their nose in the most un-American way uh, at their fellow citizens. And uh, by the way, they continue to run a government, an establishment, uh, despite uh, the fact that they have now in the White House uh, a formidable uh, opponent in President Trump. It, it is it, it's staggering. And, and to, to see this continue, I mean, for, to, for example, today, Peter, uh, Michael Hayden, former head of the CIA and NSA, uh, I, I love these words, uh, is saying that, uh, that Trump's uh, illegitimate worldview uh, is a problem. Uh, and, and because it's perpetrated with the uh, left-wing media, here it is, they, the left-wing media, uh, and they are playing with it. I think it's an illegitimate worldview, and I think it's a non-fact-based worldview. As he says this, you have to just think, my God, did the man miss an entire eight years of American presidential history? A worldview that is not supported by reality, the facts? That is a perfect description of the Obama administration. Is it not? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, look, th this is this is a test time for a lot of people in Washington, D.C., who say very eloquently and very smartly year after year that they believe in our representative form of government and they're serving our representative form of government. Well, now somebody has been elected that they don't like, that is antithetical to the way they think things should be done. And now it's the real test. Is their rhetoric actually live up to the reality? And what we are seeing of is... Of course it does. I mean, the answer people, we should should provide. Of course it doesn't. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that is a huge problem. And I think there needs to be a lot of soul searching by people in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, as to what their precise attitude is, because this is how representative mm -hmm. government works. And uh, the people <coughs> spoke and Donald Trump was elected. You don't have to agree with what his policy yeah. prescriptions are, but you have to recognize he was selected. He is now the constitutional president of the United States. And if you are in public service, you are in public service. The, the public does not work for you. You yeah. work for the public, and the public made a decision you last and, November. Bob gave me a report on the cabinet meeting, and I, I was elated on, uh -huh. on two points. One, the, uh, the Ellsbury point, and the other, the laying down the law to these guys, which I feel right now is the most important thing we can do to get... Well, but the point is that the Ellsberg case, however, comes out is going to get all through this government among the intellectual types and 
the people that have no loyalty is the idea that they will be the ones that will determine what's good for this country. That's right. God damn it, they weren't elected, and they're not going to determine it that way. Well, on the other side of that problem, Mr. President, is that if you allow something like that to go unpunished, then you just encourage uh, mm -hmm. uh, an unending flow of it. And, right. uh, on the other hand, if you nail it hard, uh, it helps to keep people uh, right. in line and discourage others. Right. That, to me, is... You know, I consider this whole problem of the making a martyr and all that sort of thing, and I just don't, don't agree with it. Uh, you're not hearing too much of that on that side, are you? Or how much are you? Well, you'll hear some from the... Uh, from Trump. Yeah, the from the left. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the argument is, well, he's he's made a hero of himself, and uh, the harder we hit him, the more we build him up. But uh, the way I size the fellow up, uh, building him up doesn't doesn't help the other side, because he's not an... Because he's a natural enemy. He's not an appealing personality. He's a damn good guy to be against. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, we've had all sorts of reports, as you know, of uh, his tie-in with other people. I think an awful lot of this will fall out. Uh, Jay Lovestone called me today to say that we haven't even scratched the surface. He said this fellow is really tied in with some bad actors. And of course, you're getting tied in with some uh, communist groups. That would be good. Well, Jay thinks Jay thinks he is, but of course that's... It's my guess that it's, he's in with some subversives, you know. Well, you know, Jay Lovestone has an interesting intelligence network, as you know. Sure. And uh, he says this document has been delivered to some very curious places by mm -hmm. Ellsberg and his cohorts. <laughs> and Jay has never been wrong on this stuff. Over. Right. He tends to be very hardline. He still, uh, he still his intelligence is good. He, he, mm -hmm. his advice was uh, when you start digging, you're going to uh, uncover a wealth of uh, right material that'll be helpful to us. Yeah. Okay. So, my friends, make no mistake. I'm not taking anything away from what I said yesterday, I'm adding to it. We're watching a silent coup that was put in place by Obama and the Democrats during the transition and before, you know, after the election. Do you know that now Sessions recused himself? Do you know who the top lawyer in the Justice Department is who will oversee whatever investigations there are? An Obama appointee. Jean-Claude Juncker, the Luxembourgian president of the European Commission, with a heritage literally making him the son of a Nazi, is taking a stand against all things populist Brexit and President Donald Trump. So Brexit isn't the end. A lot of people would like it that way. Even people on another continent. Where uh, the newly elected U.S. Pre uh, president was happy that the Brexit was taking place and has asked other countries to do the same. And if he goes on like that, I am going to promote the uh, independence of Ohio and Austin, Texas in the United States of America. Yunker, Ohio? Ohio had a very small secession movement in 2012, but that was a reaction to Barack Obama's re-election. Totally off the mark. California, sure, but Ohio, I don't think so. And then he names Texas, but not just Texas, Austin. Texas as the other place he would support to secede. Unfortunately, as an Austin, Texas resident, a few things come to mind as to why he feels Austin would become just like his dear little country Luxembourg. Austin is a model UN Agenda 21 city. The politically correct Austin City Council is packed full of left-leaning anti-fa supporting miscreants that love spending our tax dollars on white elephant projects just like Juncker has done in Luxembourg. Luxembourg. And a very public battle is brewing in Austin between the city council members, the Austin mayor, the Texas governor, and the Department of Justice over the controversial status of Austin as a leading sanctuary city. And I hope that the law that gets passed isn't one that, that, that ultimately makes us less safe. And by that I mean our public safety professionals, our police chief and the police chief before him, sure. have developed a real trust relationship in our community with all parts of our community. They say that's one of the reasons why we're one of the safest cities in the country, and we are. We're keeping 
this community pretty safe. Well, the governor would say, just look at this past case where there was a person who was arrested for a very serious crime, but it wasn't a crime that was listed under the sheriff's, I will cooperate with ICE and hold them for you, and he almost made bail. So how is that keeping this community safe when you don't cooperate 100% of the time? Austin Council Member Greg Kazar has dodged local Austin news requests to speak on his championing of illegal immigration. The Todd and Don Show on KLBJ AM has set aside 7.20 AM every weekday morning for weeks for Kazar to call in and explain his side of the story to no avail. But Kazar had no problem speaking with democracy now. So for years, our pre previous sheriff was deporting more people, helping in deportation and more people than almost any other sheriff in the country. And finally, because of campaigns at the city to stop uh, collaborating and cooperating with the county campaigns uh, to push that sheriff out, we finally elected a new sheriff. And on the same day of Trump's inauguration, uh, she announced a policy to significantly reduce our uh, compliance with voluntary ICE detainers. That is politically motivated law enforcement actions that had nothing to do with public safety and everything to do with Trump's agenda. ICE denied that vigorously, and now in open court, a judge has confirmed what we all know, which is that unfortunately, we have a rogue federal agency that is not only tearing families apart, but threatening our very democracy by taking public safety actions and arresting people for political purposes. Yes, it appears that Kazar and Adler would easily carry water for an unelected globalist dictator on the other side of the Atlantic if asked to do so. I will not at each time respond to what you are saying because what you are saying is worthless. The Senate Intelligence Committee heard testimony this week on the Russian interference in the elections, focusing in hard on the Russian cyberware capabilities. The circle of deciders is limited to a handful of Putin associates with similar worldviews. They have considerable resources at their disposal, especially since most of their tools are quite cheap. A handful of cyber criminals cost a lot less than an armored brigade, but can do a lot of damage. The elephant in the room, however, was WikiLeaks' revelation that the CIA have unrestrained cyberware resources to act just as the Russians did to benefit the deep state. The Daily Mail reports, WikiLeaks has published hundreds more files today which it claims show the CIA went to great lengths to discuss its own hacking attacks and point the finger at Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. The 676 files released today are part of WikiLeaks' Vault 7 tranche of files and they claim to give an insight into the CIA's Marble software, which can forensically disguise viruses, trojans, and hacking attacks. WikiLeaks says the source code suggests Marble has test examples in Chinese, Russian, Korean, Arabic, and Farsi. I think the Russian term is compromise, and I think it's interesting that they have a Russian term, which is compromising information. And this is active in the sense that not only can they take things off your computer, they can put things on your computer. This is one of their techniques, is it not? Yes, Americans should look to Europe where this has happened quite a bit more frequently. Based upon your expertise and knowledge, do you have, any of you have any doubt that it was Russia and Russian agents that perpetrated during the 2016 presidential campaign, the hacks of the DNC and the Podesta emails, and the misinformation and disinformation campaign that took place during the election. From the observables we get at the victim sites, you can't always connect the dots. We, you know, we can't show you a picture of a building. We can't give you a list of names of people who did it. We have to look at a lot of other factors, some of which would, you know, is incredible amounts of detail. But we've got 10 years of observation here. Uh, we've seen similar behaviors in the past. My best answer is it absolutely stretches credulity to think they were not involved. General Alexander? I believe they were involved. Dr. Reed? I believe they were involved as well. Thank you. Former members of my presidential campaign team uh, who had access to the internal information of my presidential campaign were targeted by IP addresses uh, with an unknown location within Russia. That effort was unsuccessful. I'd also inform the committee that within the last 24 hours, uh, at 10.45 a.m. yesterday, uh, a second attempt was made, uh, again, against former members of my presidential campaign team who had access to our internal information, again targeted from an IP address from an unknown location in Russia, and that effort was also unsuccessful. 
could this response to the validity of alternative news be just an attempt by the deep state to resuscitate the dying mainstream media? And is it fueled by the loathsome criminal politicians who feel the heat of the spotlight shining brightly on their previously unknown activities? We have to educate our people that they can't believe everything that they read on the on the internet and part of that is i think your very creative suggestion of a kind of uh, uh, snopes uh, expanded snopes to ch ch uh, to check the validity so people at least know okay there's some likelihood that that is uh, is uh, uh, untrue we need a state department and a dhs website that immediately refute when falsehoods are put out mainstream media companies we need to be working with them what if they boycotted WikiLeaks collectively? What if they all didn't race to publish too quickly? I'm not saying that Russia doesn't engage in cyber warfare, but diverting all of the blame toward Russia without addressing our own nefarious intelligence activities solves nothing.